Good afternoon and welcome to the continuation of the State Historical Society of North Dakota's series dealing with the history and culture of North Dakota and the Northern Great Plains. These conversations with scholars and humanity and humanists knowledgeable about our history and culture are funded by a grants to the State Historical Society of North Dakota from the North Dakota Humanities Council. Our guest this afternoon is the specialist in Sioux history and culture, Mary Louise Defender Wilson. Mrs. Wilson, I'd like to begin our conversation specifically today uh, uh, dealing with the Battle of Whitestone Hill, which is a pivotal event in the, in the history of the Northern Great Plains and especially the Indian cultures of the Northern Great Plains. And I'd like basically to begin with the question, was Whitestone Hill really a battle? Larry, in talking to people even today, the so-called battle is called and it means when the people were fired on at Whitestone Hill, which implies then that there was no battle as such. And the whole uh, understanding from our part is that there were very few men of the of the warrior, hunter, um, <clears throat> Wawanka, that's a word that is translated to mean police, but it's not police in the sense of how police are today. At, at, in the village with the women and children, there were the elderly men and the women and children. The scouts, Otunya, they were all out and they were hunting and I think that is proven by written history. Therefore, no one was prepared for a battle, that it was a camp where they were preparing for winter, going to, uh, we call like James River, Itazipo Kaksawakpa, meaning the river where you cut the, um, the wood uh, for, the, uh, for the bows. And that's where some of the people were doing all of these things that need to be done so that people could live through a North Dakota winter. The area then had tremendous significance, was well known to this particular group of Sioux? At that time, already in 1863, there was a disruption of the occupation patterns of the people. As you know, we had uh, the emergence of our people right in this area. Um, the northern group, which was part of the group that was there at Whitestone Hill, and you had the eastern group, the Santi group, we say Sayanti, and of course later on that was mistranslated to say Isanti, meaning Knife River people, but Saw is something that is kind of a mist or kind of a shrouded looking thing, in the same way with the name of the area, Minishota, which means where the, the water is kind of in vapor. And so then you had those people from the eastern group and the southern people, and of course the western people, which who are today called Lakota. And each one, as they, as they became the, the people on this earth, had areas in which they lived. And if you've ever traveled that area, in the southeastern part of what is now North Dakota is Lake Tiwaka. Tiwaka, meaning the place where something powerful lives or something sacred lives. And you leave that lake a short distance. And there is a huge white stone. I've never actually gone up to it in someone's field. But from where I see it from the road, it reminds me of a buffalo. And as you look in that general area until you get close to, to somewhere in Jamestown, in one of those rivers there, there are several rivers there, that these white stones are there. And they were the boundaries of one of these seven northern groups. And they say almost everything matched in that general area near Havana, Rutland, is a place called Silver Lake because they had all of the everything, everything fit in terms of the color. So even the waters fit. 
Now, some of the groups there probably were not that particular white or the Sans group, whichever it was. They're different, white and Sans. Sans is kind of a state of, of, a, of a shade of white, but it's not, not white mm -hmm. as such. So those people then, they were there. And if you have ever traveled in the area, you will notice that those white stones are actually there. So therefore, that is, you know, how the people of our nation, the, what is called the Dakota or Lakota people today, knew their territories and everything fit together. There would be an animal and there would be a bird and there would be a water animal and everything had this, this concept of color. Color is kind of a difficult thing for us to say in our language. You cannot say, like, what color is that? But at the same time, if something is a color, it still is, is used another word with it, which doesn't uh, explain itself very readily in English. So therefore, each one had a color as a part of the power. So that is that particular area, and the white stones are there naturally. And I'm always amazed when I go there to see how the pattern all fits. So that was traditionally the northern Dakota people's area. So, how so they were there as a matter of, of their own territory. So how did the people get to that area? I mean, how do we, we think now in terms of migrations and of peoples moving in logical patterns and sequences across the area. This is a particularly Euro-American concept. Uh, how did the Indian people well, view they, the origins of the people in, in, in that region? And many of the old writers somehow would get into the idea that the Native people, Dakota, Lakota people, have respect for the land or they look on the land very differently than Western European people did because they came out of the earth. And we say that right there in that, in that same area is the Great Bear's Den. I think it's in Ransom County. It's true it's it is. the Great Bear's Den. Now that is an emergence place. And therefore, you know, we're displacing the people, which we'll get to later in this discussion, to an area that, to which they don't have that attachment, I think has remained on the people for all of these years, since, since the 1870s and 1880s, when those people were all forced to come to the Standing Rock Reservation area, which is west of the Missouri River. Now, you use the phrase, an emergence place. What is, what is that? What is the... We all do uh, uh, a sacred process that people came out of the earth and became people. Okay, so that, so that this entire area is one that is sacred. To as one a... particular group. Right? And, and what is that group? I am not sure today because much of that is lost, but except you sort them out as you trace your accounts. I mistakenly call legends, but we call we choyake the accounts of the people, and that's how these are then become sorted out. And many times that is sacred knowledge and privilege to a few people because there is much power connected with it. And I'm sure much of that is lost to our people today. For one thing, we don't have you know, access to those places like our ancestors did. The places of power and the places right. of knowledge. The places of knowledge and wisdom and how to live as human beings. I think that was the uh, almost like a commandment so that all the people would live. Like if you think we have two things that we live by, mitakuyo eb ovanikta, and oyate yanipikta, okay, oyate yanipikta is the people will live, and mitakuya obanikta, that I might live with all of my relatives, which says then that my relatives are every living thing on this earth. And does this, does this extend as well to the white stones? This the stones, of course, are, are, are the ancient ones, and I'm sure as we understand how the earth is formed, that it is, you know, rock, and that, uh, that this comes out then, and somehow I think the white stones are at some layer of the formation of the earth when you get beyond the molten parts. So what we're, basically what I'm drawing from what you're saying, Mary Louise, is that this is a, this area, 
of the white stones or the area of the of the Missouri Coteau, as, as modern geographers would call it, is an area that is sacred by tradition, sacred by religion, sacred by heritage to a specific group of Lakota. Dakota. Dakota people. Yes, northern people, right. All right. Now, how does this, you know, in the, in the era that we're particularly concerned with here, which is the late 19th or the middle 19th century, uh, how does this translate to an occupation or a way of life in this area? I mean, how, do, how did people live in this area? Again, at that time, there was a, a disruption of the people's occupancy of their traditional areas. So some of the people lived there, I'm sure, belonged to the group. And in discussing it with even the elders today, they are not sure. I mean, you have the redfish group who say that they were there. You have the big head group. Big head, of course, is another mistranslation. Big head is Nasuna Tanka. Nasuna Tanka, Nasuna Yuka, they say. You have a brain, which means then the brain is used to think wise thoughts, beneficial thoughts for the people. And evidently, this is the type of person this mistranslated big head was. It's actually a big brain, a person who had a brain where he could think in terms of wisdom for the people. Now, I'm not sure what they, what they claim they are. Very often you can, you can determine this by some of the things that people did or some of the, even some of the ways that I know that the, uh, the granddaughter of Big Head, you know, lived in the uh, Big Lake area of Cannonball, and she was a great uh, uh, creative artist. Her name was Laura Big Head Ramsey, and I thought many of her things used to be in the, what was this old state museum. I don't know where things are now, but... And I don't know what kind of work she did. It would be interesting to see. And perhaps then one could determine if they were that white or song group that, that you know, belong, who belong there. Okay. But the people then, in other words, who lived there were those that had a traditional attachment. Right. Or else they were part of the group, part of the northern group who had, you know, the close relationship being all northern group. Then how did, they, did this group come into conflict as uh, eventually resulted in the, in the battle, or what is known as the Battle of Whitestone Hill, or is that a misnomer? <clears throat> well, of course, the battle itself, we said that that wasn't really that. That was kind of a firing on these people. Mm -hmm. And the people have always said, Isanti, or Sayanti Oicha Debi, meaning they were looking for eastern Dakota people, mm -hmm. because in 1862, that the uh, uprising as it was called, which of course was merely those people also uh, trying to gain their, uh, their compensation from the United States. As they had signed over the land and when, of course, in the old treaty idea that they were to be compensated in terms of food and rations, which was never delivered to them. And as a result, then, they proceeded then to take the food from the settlers, and the settlers, of course, I think really believed that maybe the United States government had paid the Native people, paid the Eastern Dakota, but they hadn't. So therefore then they simply took the food and there was resistance and the resulting difficulty. Some of the people left the area and you hear about them going into what is now Montana and into Canada in the Devil's Lake areas and so forth. So they were looking for these people, and from what our people say is that they um, rallied all of these militia units to come looking for them and had all of these plans. However, you hear from the people themselves that there were no Eastern Dakota in the village. I'm sure that there are you know, noted historians today who will say that Inkpaduta was there and so forth, but the people themselves say that there were no, no Eastern Dakota people in the village. And Otunye, we chayuhapi, they say, of course, the scouts they had were always out, and they knew that the militia were coming toward where they were camped. But the men were away hunting, gathering the things that needed to be gathered in, in preparation for winter, so there were just women and children. And <clears throat> to, and then when they came to, to the camp and then proceeded to, to do what they did, and they always say that, you know, that they, they were really uh, somehow 
um, not thinking properly, I guess. And when you do this kind of work, you know, you read a lot of things. Now, in, in this one, in Muni's, he's talking about, about um, wounded knee. But he says, at the first volley, the Hotchkiss guns trained on the camp opened fire and sent a storm of shells and bullets among the women and children who had gathered in front of the teepees. And the guns poured in two-pound explosive shells at the rate of nearly 50 per minute moving down on everything alive. And he goes on to say, this maddened, savage soldiers who did this at Wounded Knee. And in, in thinking about this, one thinks perhaps this is what happened to the various militia units who came in there. And the people themselves say most of the casualties occurred from their positioning themselves in such a way that they actually shot each other because there were not that many fighting men in the village itself to do that much harm to these military men. So the tradition of the battle itself, uh, of the confrontation, the firing upon, if I may use that term, uh, then says that the, that the confrontation was one of uh, inherent inequality in terms of the military component of it. Uh, the, 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 the fighting men of the, of the, of the, uh, of the Indians of the, of the Dakota were gone, in other words, and it was left to the, those who remained in camp, which would, which would be the older individuals and then the women and children to defend and to try to escape. Yes, mostly to try to escape. And, you know, and in terms of numbers, you know, in Sully's own report now, he says he, um, he destroyed uh, up to 500,000 pounds of buffalo meat, and he burned 300 teepees, and um, so much personal property that was very valuable to the Dakota people. And there were many ponies that were uh, dead and wounded, and also then they took the others. And when you know our culture, the Dakota people believed in very small families. And the Ishnana Yuhapi was the most respected family, a family where there was only one child. It's the very most, if you think of the elderly and so forth, and, and it seems to me that, that uh, in just thinking about it, that the people were running for their lives, they were they were set up on by great numbers of people, that they never took any of their belongings. This is what they always said. So if he burned every teepee, and there were 300 at the very most, 400, and four, four occupants of every one, well, then you're talking about a very low number of people, probably 12 to 1,600 people, if all the men were still in the village. And if the men being gone, well, then there were very, very few people there. The, uh, then the Indian tradition with regard to the battle itself is that uh, is, is quite different than the than the uh, the tradition or the the accounts that we have learned from uh, written sources, documentary sources. I think much of it, you know, from the official military sources, you know, says these things because you know we always have to have to make ourselves look good, and I think that um, that we pretty much believe what we want to believe. <clears throat> And you, when you look at some of these early, early writings, you look at the, this is long before that. This is the, uh, the Northern Expeditions of Stephen H. Long, 1817, 1832. In this, he talks about Dakota Wars, and each one of them, he states it's a war. But then later explanations say that one was an epidemic, where there's supposed to be a death valley. This is where the Dakota allegedly set up on the Ojibwe, but actually it was an epidemic. And then there's an earlier one in there. So as they correct themselves, you will see that these people, the Dakota people, were not a people that were spent their lives in wartime pursuits and, and wartime activities. And you have several other writers who also talk about something about the village arrangements. And you always had four groups of people who were pretty much in in balance, you had the Otoe, the scouts. And of course, the scouts were not just necessarily looking for other people. They were the ones who scouted for buffalo, a very central part of the economy and the livelihood of the people. And you had the hunter, 
the uh, Wanase Wichasha, the ones who hunted, and they were as very important. They were all equally balanced, as I see it, and the Wawanka, which today is translated policemen, but they were not policemen in a sense for lawbreakers. It was more or less to, uh, to keep things in order and see that rules were followed because they were people who lived by law. And of course the uh, uh, Akichita, the, the warrior types. But again, that was a very um, limited part of the people's activities. As you know, most of the warfare that our people had was individual. And what is probably not known is that, um, is that um, if there was ever going to be a war that involved the entire village, and this is an earlier account by Jonathan Carver going back into the, into the uh, 1700s, and he says that, uh, that if, the, if but when a war is national and undertaken by the community, their deliberations are formal and slow. And he says the elders meet, the young men, and so forth. Their priests are consulted, and even sometimes the advice of the most intelligent of their women is asked. So I think, you know, when someone says this about the Dakota or the Sioux people back at that time, you know, and I'm sure that some man told him that, <laughs> which is why he said the most intelligent women, and I'm sure we realize that most of the Dakota women were very capable and very intelligent. So therefore, war was not something that they were in readiness for. And I think the difficulty also came that they thought that the, that the people who came here from Western Europe thought and lived as they lived and were not aware that they, 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 they did things differently, that when they were in, in war or that they, they lived on war and conflict and armament and that, and that, uh, that they, they didn't understand that for a long time. Eventually, I think after experiences such as Whitestone Hill, they begin to see that they were not above attacking you know, weak and defenseless people. This uh, leads me, can lead me in several different directions with regard to the, you know, to the events and to the culture that we're discussing. Let me deal with a specific question first here. Uh, the battle itself, or the, the, the firing upon itself, is generally divided into two segments. The, one, the, the first encounter on September 3rd, 1863, and then a second encounter on September 5, 1863. Uh, is it fair to say, on a basis of what you've just said, that uh, the, the, the encounter on the 5th of September was with a returning party of hunters? It may have been. I really can't say. You know, I know that in the official documents, when they, when they, I've got an, an, a U.S. government report from the 18, 1930s, and they tried to say, you know, it was a three-day battle, three, four, and five. Mm -hmm. But we know that, you know, what happened uh, when they fired on them was on the third. And, you know, and the, some of the militiamen's diaries told how they burnt all of the belongings of the people. And that this was a, a many-day activity by many of those those military men. Mm -hmm. Now, who the others were who encountered some of the, probably the returning hunters, may have been a very small group and happened away from the village. And I can't say that I've really talked to anyone about that or that I've heard that part. You know, you hear these things from a very, almost a narrow viewpoint, what the people experienced themselves. In my own family, although we are northern Dakota, on my mother's father's side, you know, my, grand, my grandfather was from uh, the Great Falls area, which is one of the points of the, of the northern Dakota, um, the Rocky Mountains and those areas. So they were not there. And talking to my grandfather in the area yesterday, he said, well, you know, that his own grandmother, that they were up there, and of course when they talk about that, they talk about that in terms of the river, the poplar river, where the poplar trees are, that that's where they were. And they knew that there were some eastern Dakota who were trying to leave the area, even at that late time, traveling toward the north into that part of the country. So they did tell about, you know, meeting them and some of the things they brought with them and how they tried to be helpful when they arrived at these northern Dakota villages. 
but not everyone was there and not everyone can say that you know all of these things. You know them by oral tradition and if they did not, probably didn't involve your family, you didn't hear too much about it. Now I know in reading, I've read uh, Mr. Uh, Jacobson's um, paper that he, he published in the North Dakota uh, Historical Society magazine and others where it says that there was, you know, an encounter at a later time. But to say I've heard that from my own oral tradition, no, I haven't. It's quite different. Mm -hmm. What place, you know, the, the group that was at the lake, at, at, at the Whitestone Lake, uh, was hunting. You know, what place does this hold in the annual round, if you will, of the people, the people's lives? What part were they playing out while they were at Whitestone Hill there? Is this a, is, this was a traditional or an annual endeavor that they were engaged in. How does that fit into the, in, into the, into the way of life that was being followed? From what I always heard that they, sometimes when they were into these very, very great uh, efforts at, at getting ready for winter and storing food, that they would go to places where there are large numbers of rocks and that is where then when they made the jerky, when they sliced that meat real thin, and that the sun shone on these rocks, made the rocks very warm, and they were dried on those rocks. And it happened very rapidly then. You could put up a lot of meat. You know, if you put them on the, what they call the sata, or the poles sometimes, and unless you have good wind and so forth, it takes much longer to dry, and the meat isn't cured as, as thoroughly as they would be with that heat. So then they used rocks in those areas that to then, dry the meat. Then the Koto region was an area to which the, this particular group and maybe others as well had returned right. annually. Right. Right. So it holds, it was, a, it, it was like a regular stopping place, if you will. Yes. Right. Were the buffalo common there as well? I gather that there were that there were buffalo all over, you know, and they migrated too at various times. That, uh, like you have, they know when the fish would would migrate in the Missouri Hoa, they call it, and and they say they go by in 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 streams and darkened streams in the river, so they can get them all out. And they knew that mm -hmm. by what they understood about the uh, the forces of nature around them, which I suppose is something that I don't know what kind of scientists you. Call call them today who would probably understand that. But in those ways too, where then the buffalo then moved from various places guided by the seas and so they knew then they had to be somewhere in order to to get enough food for winter. So the the, the seasonal round, the, the, which is tempered by the needs of the people to prepare for winter and then their knowledge of the natural history, the movements of the animals and of the seasons themselves brought folks brought these people to the Missouri Coto area, to Whitestone Hill on a regular basis. Uh, how long had that been going on? Is there any tradition that regards to that? Regards to that? I don't know. They, people always use that, use a, uh, a, a term, a hantanaji. And I'm not sure how you really translate that. I always, um, I always translate that to mean perhaps something like uh, uh, from, from Almost the beginning, I guess, is what they say, you know. So it's a long-term, well-established cultural and, and, and economic tradition right, of the people right. of itself. And probably was more clearly defined prior to the disturbance time, you know, because the disturbing and the moving of the people, you know, disrupted their agricultural uh, work because they never knew when they would be there to continue tending their fields. And of course, you know, that they didn't necessarily transport all of this. A lot of this was put, was put in great caches underground. And I've never seen one, but I've heard that, you know, they've been uncovered in the James River area. But my, my clan uncle from Canada was telling me the other, the other day how they, that they did this, that they put it, it, it in a certain pattern in the ground and how they prepared the area underground that some of those last just years and years and years 
and that he said he heard that they found some not too long ago and the food was still good. But I don't know how true that is. I imagine <laughs> the people in the historical society are more knowledgeable about that since they know what they found. Well, don't count on that. Okay. I mean, <laughs> it is. I, the, the point I'm, I'm gradually trying to lead to here is, is, uh, is into an established pattern of life that has gone on for decades at the least and probably centuries at the most. You interject a huge disruption of a major military force disrupting this activity. And I would imagine then that that greatly changed the lives of the people. Yes, it was not only the, the military, but you realize that the epidemic diseases actually was were a probably maybe almost a bigger factor which caused even our own people, you know, to, to uh, try to drive out some of their own, their people of their own nation, some of the northern groups who uh, who were involved with the uh, with trading and so forth at some of the settlements, such as the settlement the people had at the at the confluence of the uh, of the Red River and what is today called the Assiniboine River, that that there was a huge village of one of our one of our northern groups there who then became subject to epidemic diseases. And therefore, then those people came down to the Missouri. And this is where they, where they brought then some of the sicknesses. Then, of course, at the same time, you had the military bringing up other people up the Missouri and, the, and some of our, our relatives to the south trying to stop them at various junctures in the river to keep them from bringing up the sickness because it did decimate the people considerably. And of course, not only that, of course, then the military, and of course, the trading uh, factor was also there, which created some, uh, some change in how they did things. Is there in the tradition of the people um, uh, a noticeable break as a result of these interruptions, these, these uh, uh, problems caused by the influx of, of this other culture? Is, you know, is, is, is there other traditions that, that deal with that disruption? Traditions that deal with that disruption, you mean to try to, uh, to, try to counter it? To, the, oh. to counter it or to, to account for it or that describe it? Well, they had the, uh, they had the uh, you know, the, all of a sudden the materialism that came into being. Before that, everything was, was more or less kept in balance. It didn't get out of hand. And, but then with materialism, where the traders, I think, brought in great numbers of items, then you had then some of the people, I think, going in that direction. And of course, in addition to that was the introduction of, uh, of alcohol. Granted, our people knew of mind-altering substances that were, you know, here in the, in the environment, but those were were handled in a very organized fashion and more or less to treat um, medical difficulties rather than just an indiscriminate use of the way they did with alcohol. And it was understood, of course, it was a mind-altering substance, but then many people then fell victim to that. And there was probably not too much that they could do to, to counter that because, again, you had a society where there was individualism the right to dream your own dreams and to carry them on, yet to be a part of a community. Mm. And, you know, and everybody tried to stay together. So then you, you couldn't really come out and, and, and kind of condemn a person thoroughly or get rid of them or chase them out occasionally, though for other infractions they were. But then people did, you know, uh, lean toward the materialism, which I think had disrupted their lives very much. But this was the single greatest change of uh, in in the in the culture of the people as a result of the uh, the influences from the from the white from the Euro American. Yes, and I think that the that the the attitude or the the understanding of the land, which were at, at very you know, just simply opposing ideas of what the land is, what the earth means. Mm -hmm. And probably we're still there today, you know, in today's world. We still haven't reconciled this understanding, what, how our ancestors understood the earth and how everything that made us human and everything that made us live as human beings and to live in a nonviolent condition came to us from the earth itself. 
and yet you had another culture who who's, was in a sense probably detached from from the influences of the earth and couldn't really incorporate the goodness and the wonderfulness and the sacredness of the earth into their lives. And that perhaps was the greatest difference and that didn't really take hold, I think, until much later, but it hasn't taken hold of all of the Dakota Lakota yet because it comes into the understanding of man's spiritual self. Does Whitestone Hill fit into that change that we've just described in attitudes, this, this understanding of spiritual self? It must have to the people who were there as a part of it, you know, as a part of the, the evolvement of man and the evolvement of the earth into the condition it is, it was then and is today. And there is, um, you know, the, the attitude then of talking about war, talk to some of the people, and I, I remember hearing about, uh, about the way that they talked about war and killing. <clears throat> we have a, a ceremony called the scalp dance. It's uh, and I know that uh, there are gory pictures painted of the scalp dance, you know, somebody removing all the hair on the head and doing all these things, but if you see some of the earlier paintings, you know, some of the people who traveled in this area painted full, painted pictures of the people that they saw, kind of as they saw them, and you'll see that there would usually be the hair done on one side, open, the other side braided, and usually then a special part of the hair uh, treated differently, either put together some way, perhaps with a feather and so forth. And that comes from, a, from an explanation that's offered by a Reverend James Lind in his manuscript where he says the, the uh, Dakota people have an understanding of the spirit that a part of it is in the hair. So when our people uh, took, went to battle and uh, took and overcame a person, a koka, we, that's what we call all these other ones who are not of our groups, a koka, a different person, well then they would, they would take that then and they would bring it back because, you know, people who said that all life was sacred and all life was worthy of respect couldn't do away with another human being without in a sense appeasing that so when that was brought home that was put on a stick and a relative of that man who did it would somehow uh, deal with his psychological self because of what happened to him when he killed and she either a sister or a a woman cousin or the mother or an aunt would be the ones to dance with that while the songs were sung and then to take care of what was in that that man's uh, thinking when when he did that therefore you know our villages were not violent places they were places of peace and quiet like we say when we talk about this particular instance they had no idea that they were going to be faced with that kind of a catastrophe and that, uh, that they were wahbana, they say about themselves, they were gentle people. And that is the way they used to describe, that is the word they used to describe themselves. And knowing what I know about, in spite of everything that people have been here today, who have been through, who are here today, that, that that's probably true because we've come through tremendous, uh, terrible things. And yet, we still have some of that with us. Certain families who followed the traditions are very much of that mind. So you had that custom of, of dealing with, with battle. And then they had two others, uh, oh, uh, three others, Oyagiea, Igduta, Waktegdi Wogodakapi. And this was incorporated with even how they ate at a public gathering or a feast. But before, when a man, if a man oyagiea and told, all right, I went to, um, I went and got these horses from the Pawnees, and I did this and this and encountered one, and this is what I did. 
And he did not immediately give away all of his valuables, or his relatives didn't step forth and do it for him. They would take away from him everything. They would say. They would take away everything decent that he owned. And this was carried on in the other discussions of where they went into battle against the enemy, like if they igdupa, when they were at a ceremony and any part of the ceremonial regalia happened to fall, they would call some known person who went into uh, into an in a, in a um, an encounter with a tolka to go through them to do a, a a pantomime action of what happened to him. Now, in later times, people say, "Well, they didn't do that in the old days." But knowing how we are, I would say we probably did. This one elderly man in the community where I'm from. There, uh, Bahayamani, it's called Three Buttes, or Porcupine, or in the Shields area, that when they allowed them to have dance ceremonies again in the 20s, 1920s, well, then they would do that if someone dropped paraphernalia or they went through this Chech Pakpe, they call it, where before you eat, you, you somehow go through this, this ceremony with this food. Well, this one man who had gone to, uh, gone to battle against the... Uh, against the crows. Now, see, the crows initially were part of our nation also, but then they became separated and, of course, then assisted the military and became scouts and so forth. So then, so then they, were, they were then uh, uh, considered not really toka. They were still kangri chasha. They were always named as such. They weren't true. But anyway, that's who he took horses from. So when he was called to, to pantomime what he did, well, they always tell, well, he... He went through the motions of, uh, of putting the paint on his face, and then he went through the motions of fixing up his hair. He did this all in motion, how he combed out this one side, but they said, oh, he pretended he combed his hair with this comb. You know, they had a porcupine tail that they used to make a hair, hairbrush with it. He'd comb it. Then he pretended he had long hair, and he'd comb way out there, so someone in the crowd would say, oh, he was just almost bald, you know, but this is what they would do, and it would be looked on that way, but he would still donate, but they would add this dimension of it not being, you know, a deadly serious thing that everything was put in. So then the focal point was not on the killing, and I overcame someone. Instead, there was an attempt to balance the whole e effort out. Mm -hmm. To make it human. Yes, to make it human. And see, I think that that I'd like to say that, you know, back then in 1863, the people who came here didn't understand about this nation that was here in what is today Minnesota, North and South Dakota, and what is Montana, and up into Canada. They thought that, that they were all one group, and they didn't realize how we were from these four directions. And today, that is still not understood are not told and also about the land itself, the earth itself. And there is a need, I think, for us as Dakota people to re-educate ourselves and also to impart some of this wisdom and this way of life to the people who came here. Mm -hmm. And it was misunderstanding that caused Sully, you know, to, uh, to be pursuing this or to be coming into that area and doing that and my own personal understanding of myself as a Dakota and of that northern group, Wahbana, they say, a gentle people. So I guess I don't think that there's much really to be gained by detailing the shots and the killing and the dead and so forth except we know that they were taken prisoner. They lost this property, which is the one thing they talk about. As late as 1931, they tried to, to be compensated for that loss from the United States. But of course, the old, I think it was an Indian agent named Galbraith in 1861, wrote, you know, how these, he called them Yankton in those days, were always over there with this Sisi Tuan Wachbe Tuan people. And that uh, that they were that they were part of it and participated in the hostilities, but I, but I was wondering, you know, if the United States, you know, kind of did these things, so that you don't want to admit a wrong. Sometimes I think starting with the truth 
is is good for everyone and would uh, would help this land to to be what it's supposed to be, and for the United States to be again a respected country, whose word the world can rely on, and whose message of peace and wisdom and prosperity can extend throughout the world, because this is what made our country what. Well, our country was great, you know, when the when when the um, Washicho or the Western European people first came here, and it was, stayed that way for so many years. And now we're kind of at a at a place where I guess we need some reassessment, reconciliation, reexamination, and direction. And at Whitestone Hill, to go to to go back to that original example, it was just an example of if I can use that term, was an example of the misunderstanding, the lack of oneness, if you will, with, with the world around us, uh, that, that the white culture imposed upon the native cultures who were here. Uh, the, as late as 1931, uh, according to what you just said, the, uh, the people tried to obtain compensation for what they lost at Whitestone Hill. What did happen to them after Whitestone Hill? I gather that some of them, some of them remained at, uh, in that where they were taken as prisoners, and some of them came back. And in later times, then they were they were moved uh, to the western part, western side of the Missouri River. Yet, when you go to Cannonball, North Dakota today, and you talk to the people, "Iu ech dank um hehan," they say. "Iu ech da hiu yab hehan." "Iu ech da" means like. Across, I always tell people that the prepositions in Dakota and the prepositions in English are are like uh, I don't know, are like uh, like uh, maybe uh, water and uh, and stones or something that that they just don't um, translate into each other. But the people pass this information from generation to generation about we were across the river and that somehow was our homeland. And that's what that means, across, and that's where they were. And they will say, I think, about three different people that I just talked to at random about uh, that, uh, that idea of, of that, uh, of, of Whitestone Hill and so forth. Well, we, we uh, crossed the Missouri to this side at the insistence of the United States and the military forces. This was a considerable time, you know, after Whitestone Hill. And we came here. The United States said, you people are farmers. You people are not uh, hostile. Because about this time, I think you had a situation where Sitting Bull had actually been forced into hostile activities and was uh, certainly, you know, giving the U.S. military quite a run for their money, as they say. Like one of the elderly men I was talking to on, uh, at home just now said, you know, here we were, we were minding our own business and trying to continue on our lives when the U.S. military came on us and, uh, and fired on us and destroyed our, our people and destroyed our belongings. A few years later, Khatanka uh, Iotaka, a few years later, Sitting Bull hit him across the face, this little description that he used. And so then the U.S. Well, then was pretty well riled up, I guess, over that because they were, in a sense, really slapped across the face by that. And, um, and, and they were trying to find ways, I think, to settle things down because they couldn't continue, you know, the uh, losses and the cost of uh, always trying to put down the Dakota and Lakota people. So they told the, uh, that group of, of people who were occupying that area there, uh, Whitestone Hill, south of the James River area, that if you go across to that reservation, that uh, you, know, you can help us to, to, uh, to, to make him cease his hostile ways and his making war. Once you've helped us in that fashion, you can always return. And I think the people still say that to each succeeding generation. In thinking about it, okay, it's, you know, like over 100 years now, the late 1870s, 
Some of them are still over here in the, in the, in the early 1880s. But people for a hundred years and five generations who've lived in a different land, under a different system, and losing, you know, any semblance of their ancient democracy in the, in the way the U.S. has, has really aided uh, a government on the Standing Rock Reservation. How can we overcome that, or what can we do? It would take at least a good generation of people and if we and if we were if we were say going to come back to this side of the river, what would we really do when now we have established the ties? But on the other hand, what can be done to reconcile that whole tragedy because things become a part of people when they're told to them, and when you hear those things as a child, they become a part of you. And I think of that because, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a place that has these mystical sites, the earth itself. So how do we, how do we, um, we put that back in place for everyone? Should our people um, want to again go back, go back and understand some of that and for the people who came here because you know everything that's set up gets scribbled on or else they get uh, debris thrown on it and so we kind of live in a in a ruthless condition but yet we we somehow need to deal with that and I, it seems that it can only be done by a reconciliation of, of the people who, who were there, the people who are there now, and all of the people who are here now in North Dakota to perhaps change our, the course that we are, we are following or the, or the path that we're on, which seems to be somehow a negative path because I think that, you know, people came to North Dakota, the people who came here, North Dakota is kind of distinguished in that. I think it's the second or third place in the whole United States where people live to be elderly. Granted, maybe they brought over some of that in their genes, but perhaps the environment. The land. The land itself, because that's the way our people were. And the, our people who still live close to the land, you know, they're still very active. This grandfather of mine is 86, and we talk among ourselves, some of us who consider ourselves the younger generation, to some of them he's an uncle. You know that uh, my, my, uh, my aunt was saying, you know, Uncle Bill has a mind like a computer, you know, and he says all of this in our language, and it's amazing how his mind works, and he's 86. And my uncle from Cannonball is 87, and he spaded his garden by foot because they were supposed to go in and plow, but they didn't. So he spaded his garden by, by shovel and foot and put in his, uh, our own corn, our white corn, and put in some squash. But, you know, the people who live that way somehow have strength and have, I don't know, some kind of a belief or an energy that makes them live. So if I'm, if I'm to draw from what you're saying, the, the, the change in culture was one of a loss of place, a loss of sense of tie to that place. And, and we need to regain that if we're ever to become whole again. It's a, a sense of place and a sense of, of the spirit, because I think that people who came here from another country, well, they profess a, a belief in some kind of a spirituality. It is so far removed from where they are. And I'm always curious, how do they really relate to that? Or do they, or have they um, synthesized that with something else? Or is it really out up there in the universe where everybody seems to look for everything? You know, even now you hear people saying, well, such and such a thing happened and there was this force that came from outer space that caused life which again is, you know, directly in opposition to what we, we believe. 
life came life. from life came from the earth. Life came from the earth itself, right? Who it is. I we're we're nearing the end of our hour, and I would like to add uh, have you talk for just a moment about your family connection to Whitestone Hill. Well, my uh, my mother, you know, was um, a daughter of See uh, the Bear and Unchare Dutawi, and Unchare Dutawi was the daughter of a woman named White uh, Good Day and a man named Hechaka uh, Unjincha, Bobtail Elk. And from what I understand, Good Day was a part of the group there. And, uh, and from that, that standpoint is what I heard about the, the military first and then taking the prisoner. Something I heard as a child and the burning of their property and how that, to see the food, the 500,000 pounds of of buffalo meat burning was something that they, that evidently Good Day imparted to my mother since she looked after my mother and I guess she was uh, going to have my mother's mother at the time she was part of that. And so I've heard about it from them that, that this is what happened there. But you hear about it from that sense, kind of a narrow, a narrow view of of what her interpretation was, because as my my clan grandfather was telling me that uh, for some reason when they went through these pantomime actions, or the oyagiea, or wakdegdi wogadaka, for some reason they never talked about uh, about killing a awashicho or a white person. Now, I'm not sure why. I never heard why they never did that. So as a result, then the actual fighting part was not told. I know that uh, my, uh, my grandfather on my, on my mother's side, see the bear, he was always called upon to, to be one of these pantomime uh, people when they dropped any paraphernalia. And he, of course, uh, went to uh, went to war against the Pawnees, and so this is what he would tell. But I'm not sure why it was why it was different when the Pawnee Arikara came up, the Missouri. Then there was always that difficulty, not because they were against them, but because of the fact of the epidemics. And somehow it was always personalized. Somehow they would talk about who it was that they encountered. Like they talk about the time that they took the horses from the uh, from the real heavy set pony. Evidently, he came and and he was very very um, adept at still. So then he took a whole lot of Dakota horses. So they pursued him and then they got them back from him. But that's always told too, you know, that they did this. But it was always personal and identified. I'm not sure why they did not do this with the white people. I really. All my, my clan grandfather says, I don't know, they just never did. If we're to uh, draw any lessons from the traditions of the people surrounding this battle and the events that are connected to it, uh, what would those lessons be? I think the lessons are that, uh, that the area of communication and uh, and actually not in, in the stereotype. You know, we have a tendency to think everyone is like ourselves and everyone's going to behave like ourselves. Or as we, as we saw, you know, that there was this, you know, you'll see the Dakota people referred to as being fiends and savages and so forth, but that was not our, our way that we were, that we had a civilization that was organized, a manner of of caring for for the incapacitated needy people and that the attitude toward them was such that almost everything was set up to to meet the needs so that your people were not needy and that everyone was together and worked together today we have a, a different way of looking at things and to get into the gory details of, of a battle very much as we see in today's world, the violence that exists 
and the fear that is in man's higher hearts and minds and spirits today is brought about somehow because we're not not able to feel that belonging and that oneness with what is what is on us. So in talking about these battles, I think what was behind it, the, the lack of communication, the lack of understanding, and the knowledge and that was necessary is 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 still can be emphasized because perhaps we haven't learned our lesson today yet, not even in our dealings around the world. And with that, we'll close. This has been an, the last another of our conversations with regard to the history and culture of the Northern Great Plains. Our guest has been Mary Louise Defender Wilson. My name is Larry Remily. Mm -hmm.